are listening to the MPI Paranormal Podcast, where the truth is to be found. A podcast exploring all things paranormal, hauntings, UFOs, crypto, the unknown. members believe in the skeptical approach, but with an open mind, just trying to make sense of it all. I want to get back in there, try to figure that out, because it is the unknown. I don't really have a say on it right now, because I don't know what the video looks like. Well, I'm looking for the evidence. What's the evidence? A story to me is not really evidence, because that's one person's experience. Right. And I do, I take my personal beliefs into it, but like you said, then I have my skeptical side that right. wants to prove it another way. Military Paranormal Investigations is not affiliated to any branch of the military. It's time. Coming to you from North Texas on multiple platforms for maximum reach. Here are your hosts, members of the MPI team. We're having a very special podcast tonight. We are at Fort Belknap in Newcastle, Texas. Yep. My name's Jeff. I'm Rob. I'm Mike. Oh, I'm, I'm Jim. I'm Jim Hammond. <laughs> Tonight we have, you want to introduce him? Tonight we have with us here, the he is the, what is your official title? Director, Director. historian, superintendent, whatever. He um, is. He, jack of all trades. Oh. There you go. He has a master's degree in history and he's working on soon to be PhD. Mm-hmm. Uh, in history, and he's going to, he is over Fork Mountain that here, and he's going to talk with us a little bit about the history. Well, I think we probably need to How did start, we find yeah, this place? Exactly. exactly. Yeah. You know, we were, being military background, we all have an interest in the history. Right. So I know, I think it was you and I. Yeah, it was you and, and Allison. Allison. Yeah, we, we wanted to start doing historical battlefields and right. locations where all that uh, the old military was at right i was um, actually heading out towards the old post out behind the baker hotel that's right in mineral wells when you guys said you were heading down here i was like well i'll just take a u-turn you know come yeah. down and follow you guys yeah. down here well and we got here and we were uh, immediately ecstatic of how the place looked and, and the history to it yeah. and i started talking to jim's wife mm-hmm about you know some of the history and she said well hold on let me let me uh, get you to my husband he knows all the history of the place well he he she handed me the phone and he was on it and we started talking and then he found out who we were and he's like oh paranormal he says i got some stories to tell you (laughs) and we'll go into the stories towards the end of the uh the podcast here but like I said, he invited us out here. Mm-hmm. We greatly appreciate yes, Jim your time you. certainly, certainly. coming out here and, and giving us the history of Fort Belknap. Because I will tell you, before I got here, I had I no clue what yeah. this this was even yeah. about. It was even here, really. Yeah. Because yeah. we were actually looking at the trail of all that. We were going to take the the Fort trails. Right. Go, we were going to start up because we already did Fort Richardson. Right. And yeah. then we were going to come down and do this one, and then um, the one at Graham. Is I think it Fort Griffin, Jim. Fort, we have Fort. Well, there's uh, Fort Richardson's in Jacksboro. Right. We would be the next one if you're following it that way, and then um, on the just north of Albany is Fort Griffin. Yeah, that was the other one that we were going to okay. do. So kind of what we're going to do tonight is we're not going to do our normal <laughs> podcast. This is going to be a lot about history. Right. Yeah. We guys want we want you guys to hear the history of Fort Belknap and I will tell you if you're remotely close to this place Take a trip out here. Definitely. You need to come out. Let me tell you, when we were on our way down, and and, and I'll say this, before we ever start recording here, this place is beautiful. It's gorgeous. Uh, It's shaded. It was cool. When we were driving down, we, you know, I loaded up this morning. It was hot. It was nasty. We were driving down in the truck and we were passing through the mesquite fields. And I thought, man, this is going to be miserable (laughs) when we get here. So we pulled up and it is like a shaded oasis out here and it's absolutely gorgeous there's a lot of history there's a lot of unique buildings and i think it's i think this is going to be a really fun time i think so yeah so jim if you will give us a little background on 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 what you're doing and how you got here okay and then if you will just 
go into the history of Fort well, Belknap. Absolutely. So, and I will tell you, um, when y'all showed up, I wasn't here. I hardly ever leave the fort. And that one day I was gone. And so she called and she's always worried about that. Somebody's going to start asking her history questions. <laughs> yeah. And so she called. And did you know that there is a, you, you're not supposed to use your cell phones when you're driving in Wichita Falls. Yeah. And I was FaceTiming with you when <laughs> driving down Southwest, and I was, I was so excited about it. And, of course, I mean, I, I immediately turned around and came back because I was excited about this. But, um, yeah, so um, th- this is – my wife and I have been here for six years, um, going on six years. Um, prior to that, we were – I was the director at uh, in Fort Stockton um, for the Fort Stockton Historical Society over the fort and the, the museum there. Um, and then uh, – uh, and then prior to that, I was at MSU um, in grad school, uh, working on my master's in history. Um, and that's when I found really, I knew Fort Belknap existed. Mm-hmm. I did not know its significance until I started on my master's thesis. And just so much, and, and my master's thesis really focused on kind of the secession crisis in Texas, uh, 1859, 1860, and, and early 1861. And all roads led to Fort Belknap. Um, Fort Belknap, whenever Fort Belknap was, we'll get into this, but it was, it replaced um, the fort that was at Fort Worth, so it was a major crossroads. Mm -hmm. And um, whenever you realize, whenever I realized, like you said, driving out here, there's there's nothing. You're driving to absolutely nothing. And then you realize that there was something here that was, um, at one time, helped settle the West. Um, that this place had that big of an impact. There's just kind of that amazing um, idea that you, that you think about of, of something that no longer exists that once was just such a big deal. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of, I guess, it's kind of the feeling of the ghost towns. You right. know, yeah. there used to be a town here, yeah. there's nothing there anymore. Um, and, and so that, that's kind of how I, I, my master's thesis kind of led me to um, Fort Belknap. And, and when I was in grad school, I, I taught um, early American history. Um, to, to college freshmen and I didn't want to teach I never really wanted to teach in a classroom setting I'd always wanted to either work with the historical markers or at a historic site or something like that um, and so whenever I, I was working on my master's thesis I found Fort Belknap I kind of designed my life of getting out of grad school and coming to work here that's wow. kind of how because I just I love this place so much when I got out of grad school, I went down to Fort Stockton. Um, I was down there for two years. Um, and that place has got amazing history, but it's post-Civil War. It's not really where my focus is at. And I mean, I just kind of had this, man, I really loved this area. So then two years later, I uh, found out the job's open. Um, mm-hmm. Somebody let me know and, and I applied and showed up and we've been here for six years. Um, and kind of... Um, to any new visitors that would come in, we've just done a complete remodel of the museum um, and, and updated it to make it look more like a museum. We're not completely done. We've got a little bit left, but yeah. we've done quite a bit here. Um, yeah, it, it's beautiful. It really is. Yeah. You I have a ton Indian of artifacts is. that yeah. are absolutely yes, yes. amazing. We, we, we do. We have um, the amount of artifacts. Are, and, and whenever we did this renovation, I went through every one of these artifacts, cleaning them, really? researching them, trying to, you know, get a little bit of information, more information than was there. Because a lot of times it would just be um, what they thought the artifact was and then who donated it. Right. And you would also have labels that said, um, you know, this um, uh, it was over 100 years old. Well, it was over 100 years old in 1960. Wow. So we've, you know, and it, yeah, so right. now we're, we're, yeah. right. we're, we're 60 years past that so sure. it's 100 so I was going trying to find dates and stuff you know trying just to get it um, a little bit more information on there and I, I mean went through it and we kind of placed and we're not done we've still got quite a bit to do but um, I'd say we're about 80% done but kind of one of the ideas was of redoing this and this kind of will lead into the history of, of the fort um, I had a school group from Fort Worth come out mm-hmm. and we've got a direct relationship Fort Belknap has that direct relationship with Fort Worth in the, she was probably, she might have been third grade, and she asked her teacher, "Why would anybody live out here?" <laughs> and I thought she was talking about now, you right. know. And so I, yeah, I said, "Well, I mean, it's got its charm, right. and I love history." And she goes, "No, I mean, even back then, why would anybody move out here?" And I thought, "There's nothing in the museum that explains that." Right. Um, and so that's why we we got some funding to to redo this, uh, it, so we could tell the story, but. 
um, and that direct relationship with Fort Belknap. So what happens, um, and I'm just going to jump into um, the history of the fort. So what happens after the Mexican-American War ends in 1848 is you got a lot of people that are moving to Texas. Um, the western edge of settlement at that time was roughly where Fort Worth is at, and you go south. Okay. Um, that's really the way—I mean, yeah, there were some other— uh, settlements beyond that, but that was roughly the Western Edge of Settlement. Well, 1848, the Mexican-American War is over with. One of the things that a lot of these soldiers got whenever they got out of the military was land pension. That land was now available in Texas. So it, it not only has Texas secured, it, 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 Texas has become a state now. It's get under the protection of the federal government. We don't have to worry about Mexico anymore because we just won that war. And now you've got a lot of soldiers that are looking for land. All these things kind of converge at one time. And so Texas, there's just a boom in population. So that western edge of settlement moves further west than Fort Worth. And it, they, they become um, uh, the, the, the settlers that move beyond that line are no, no longer protected by the forts. The whole idea of these forts was to protect the settlers from the Native Americans that were in the area. Right. Um, and, and specifically, if we want to get really specific, it was really the Comanche Indians, and a little bit later, it was the Kiowa Indians. You had both of those. But um, so the idea was because this westward expansion happened, we're going to build a fort 100 miles beyond the closest settlement because nobody in their right mind would ever move beyond that. Right. Yeah. Ever. Of course, we now know yeah. that we're all the way to the Pacific <laughs> Ocean. Yeah. But um, the fort that was in Fort Worth, said about, if you're familiar with Fort Worth, it's about where the courthouse is at. It was kind of where the fort was at. There is a Belknap Street right there. Okay. That was a direct military road here to, to, to Fort Belknap. So what happens in 1851, they pick this location. They pick, pick it because it's 100 miles beyond. It's actually uh, the closest town at that time was Weatherford. Um, Weatherford's about 80 miles from here, but they chose this specific location because of its uh, proximity to the river. We're in a bend of the river that's uh, a mile away from us. This is actually the second location of the fort. The original location is where Newcastle is at now. Okay. But it was only there for six months. The problem being they couldn't get um, potable water. I see. So they moved to this location. Um and uh, they chose this location for two reasons. It's proximity to the water and the fact that it's on a hill. It's got a high vantage, vantage point, so you can see everything coming around. You wouldn't know that now because of all the trees. Right. But back then, there were no trees. Um, so they chose this location. Whenever they built the fort, um, it, it took them... So 1851, they started construction here. By 1853, Fort Worth was closed and everything was transferred here. Everything was here now. And then there was another fort um, just south of or south of Fort Worth, about 40 miles, called Fort Graham, which is where Lake Whitney is at now near Cleburne. So Fort Belknap replaces both of those forts, and all the soldiers are moved out here. And they chose this location. What we consider Fort Belknap today is only about a third of the size of what the actual fort was. Wow. Um, we, from where we're sitting at in the commissary uh, museum right now, to the north of the fort, there's a, um, some houses up there. Just on the other side of those houses is where the officers' quarters were at. And then as you come around to the northwest, that's where the, there was a, a hospital quartermaster's office, a billiard hall. There was, a, um, of course, with the hospital, there's also what they call the dead house, what we would consider a morgue oh. now. And then there was also a military cemetery. Um, beyond that, that was and that was really the busy end of the fort where that hospital and, and quartermaster's office were at. Um, after the fort closed, the population dispersed through a series of events, and these buildings were kind of taken, dismantled, and um, taken to use for other buildings. So, for instance, if you go into, if you happen to come out here, if you go in, if you're coming from Wichita Falls, mm -hmm. and you come here, you'll go through Newcastle. There's a gas station there in Newcastle called Jerry's. Mm -hmm. If you look on the back yeah. side of that building, and actually, um, I, I'm, I'm, I think three of the main buildings in downtown Newcastle, um, well, whatever is downtown, <laughs> <laughs> um, if you look, you know what to look for, you can see those buildings were built from Fort Belknap Rock. Oh, wow. Um, so anyway, and the fort was restored in 1936. That's why the wall is around the fort. A lot of people ask, why is the wall so short? Well, that wall wasn't a military wall. They, they, this, we had the high ground advantage, so mm -hmm. you can see for miles and miles around. That uh, vantage point was the wall. 
Okay. They didn't need a wall around, and none of the forts in Texas had walls around them. Right. Um, none, yeah. none of the military forts did. And, and uh, the Comanche Indians weren't stupid. They weren't going to attack a fortified position. So that kind of gives you the layout of, of what the fort looks like. Um, but in 1851, they moved out here. Um, and this was really a, the, the fort was really more of a, it was a proving ground. So what happens is they send all these soldiers out to the frontier. Whenever they first come out here, they send infantry soldiers out here. Now you have to remember the the American military complex at that time had shown its dominance. We've beat the British twice. We just beat Mexico. We are a dominant force, mm-hmm. definite, definite superpower now. And West Point's booming at this time. Every major commander um, in the military comes through West Point. So the Mexican-American War is over with. Now you've, and this is the first time the United States has a standing army that it's in peacetime. The first war that uh, the United States fought with a standing army was the Mexican-American War. Well, now you've got all these soldiers, you got to do something with them because we're not fighting anymore. Mm-hmm. Well, let's put them out on the frontier. So they send them out here and they send the infantry out here. Well, now herein lies the problem because if we're looking at um, an us versus them thing, thinking, thinking United States citizen versus who the enemy is at that time, or them in the 1850s, it would be the Comanche Indians. <clears throat> Now, the problem is, is you've just sent a bunch of soldiers out here in bright blue uniforms and didn't give them horses. Okay, so it's infantry out here. Right. Well, the Comanche are arguably the greatest light cavalry that's ever existed. Yeah. So there is no competition when it comes to a military battle there. The only thing that we would have over them is gunpowder. Yeah. Well, you know, we've got the guns right. and we've got bodies. But when it comes to maneuvers, to tactics, to strategy, they've got us whipped. Um, so, I mean, when you look at that, you really kind of see the failure of the federal government not knowing who their enemy is because the, the military, everything being taught out of West Point at that time is that gentleman's warfare, Napoleonic warfare, where you stand in a line and fight. Comanche Indians didn't play by those rules. <laughs> so what happens is they, um, they realize that they're, they're overwhelmed. They don't know what they're doing. The, so they, then they decide to bolster the infantry by sending dragoons out. Um, which dragoons are mounted infantry. They ride their horse into battle and get off the horse to fight. Um, and then they also send artillery out here. And I explain it this way whenever, especially like when I'm talking to children, if you're standing in the middle of the railroad tracks, you don't want to get hit by a train. What do you do? You get off the tracks. Okay. If you're looking down the barrel of a cannon and you don't want to get shot in the face yeah. by a cannon, what do you do? You move out of the way. Yeah. <clears throat> so a cannon was pretty much useless against it. Sound, it was loud. Um, and, um, for that reason only would it have any kind of effect, but it was never put into play for any kind of skirmish ever. So you've got the dragoons and you got the artillery out here, but still, that Napoleonic warfare is the name of how to play. And, and, and they, the military had been told numerous times, you're not going to beat the Comanche by doing that. And I think um, uh, John Coffey Hayes, the famous Texas Ranger, actually pled with the military department down in San Antonio You've got to use a revolver, and you've got to train your soldiers on horseback. But you're a, say you're a commander in the military, and you've got this trashy-looking Texas Ranger um, show, because they were buckskins. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. seriously, that's right. what they were. They didn't, you know, tobacco stains down their chin, wearing buckskin. Who is he to tell me? I right. just graduated from West yeah, Point. Highly educated. So, yeah. you know, you, you just think that, that kind of that mentality— well, by 1855, by 1854, they're realizing that they've got to do something else. So Jefferson Davis, um, he was uh, Secretary of War at the time. He creates the cavalry. And, of course, that's the famous second cavalry is what was sent here. Now you're getting a little bit better because you've got a cavalry. You've got mounted soldiers coming in against a mounted enemy. But the problem was still the, the strategy, the tactics that they use. Yeah. And there's this interesting thing that I've kind of researched. The federal government shows up, uh, or the, the the Second Cavalry shows up two days after Christmas, 1855. And when they get here, the um, <laughs> whenever they get here, the um, it, it, they're in, a, in the middle of a, a blue norther. A lot of these soldiers are introduced to this yeah. for the first time. They show up here, um, and they're immediately dispersed. 
throughout the state. Well, what happens, so they, they come two days after Christmas, 1855. In early 1856, you see a drop in Indian attacks. And then in October 1856, those Indian attacks skyrocket. What I think is happening is you've got these new soldiers that showed up. The Indians sit back in the hills and watch and learn them. Sure, yeah. yeah. And then October is, um, well, we call it the Comanche Moon. October is when the big raid would go on. And so that was their prime opportunity. We, we, we've we seen these new soldiers. We know how they work. Yeah. They're not any competition to us. And so 18, October 1856, those attacks start back up. Wow. Um, in 1850, so in kind of the backtrack, in 1854, the federal government decided to create the reservation system. So in Graham, um, just south of Graham, there was an Indian reservation there, and then there was another one north of Fort Griffin um, where Camp Cooper was at. That was the upper uh, Brazos Reservation. The upper Brazos Reservation was for Comanches. Okay. Lower Brazos Reservation was for what we would consider the peaceful Indians, the, the Caddo, the Waco, Tonkawa. The lower reservation was successful, very successful. The upper one, because it was Comanche, was not. But because the upper one was not successful, that what happened with them affected those that were on the peaceful reservation. And now at that time, people on the frontier weren't really didn't really care to differentiate between what tribe you were with. You were an Indian. You were scared. We we're scared of you. Um, we see you as the enemy. So what happens is you get a bunch of men on the front, and you still have Indian, sporadic Indian attacks happening. Um, well, what happens is you get a bunch of men kind of riled up, and they decide that they're going to go storm the lower reservation, the, pre, the, the, the peaceful reservation. They're going to storm it, and um, it, we're either going to kill all the Indians or, or we're going to scare them out of here. We're going to at least teach the federal government that this the reservation is, or the Indians need to be removed from Texas. Yeah. So what happens is John Baylor, he has a whole bunch of men, and that's what exactly what they do. Now, the commander that's here at Fort Belknap hears of this. He realizes what's going to happen. His name's uh, Colonel uh, Plummer. Um, he finds out what's, uh, what's going to happen, and so he sends troops from Fort Belknap to go protect the Indians. And there's, there's one of these interesting ironies of history that I absolutely love. So our artillery, the cannons were put here at Fort Belknap to protect the settlers from the Indians. But the only time they were ever used was to protect the Indians from the settlers. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's, it's fascinating, wow. fascinating stuff. <clears throat> so anyway, but that incident led the, the state of Texas and the federal government to, to decide to close the reservation. So they move all the Indians to um, Indian territory, what is now Oklahoma. And also at the same time, you've got a situation in Utah with the Mormons that they're sending military um, soldiers there. So what happens is... Uh, General Twiggs down in Texas, uh, San Antonio, decides to close Fort Belknap and send all these soldiers to Utah. Well, they, after the Indians are moved on the reservation, they start heading to Utah. And word gets back that this situation in Utah has resolved itself. So the soldiers turn around to come back to Texas and come back to Fort Belknap. And General Twiggs says, no, Fort Belknap's closed. And so he kind of disperses them throughout the state. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's really so. A lot of people, when you argue, if you were talking about the the life of Fort Belknap, a lot of people will say 1851 to 1859. I I disagree with that because so 1859 the soldiers are gone. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that this place was still a booming place in 1860. Um, Captain Richard Johnson of the Texas uh, State po Texas State Police, uh, Texas Mounted Patrol. Uh, I guess you would consider them, they were kind of a, a military Texas Ranger, um, really as a militia that they mm. put together, uh, kind of under the auspices of the state of Texas. He meets in 1860. He meets uh, in May of 1860. He gets rendezvous with 200 men here at Fort Belknap. Fort Belknap's closed militarily wise. He meets with 200 men here to go on an expedition to chastise Indians. So the fort is still being used. Okay. And then, of course, the Civil War, once the Civil War starts in 1861, the fort's manned off and on um, throughout the whole Civil War with Confederate soldiers and Texas Rangers. Um, and, and that's really an understudied period of time um, whenever you're thinking about uh, Texas history. And Fort Belknap is rich in history, especially during the Civil War. But what happens during the Civil War is all your able-bodied men between the ages of 18 and 45, and then later 18 and 55, are conscripted to fight in the war. 
Well, that depletes the frontier of any protection, except for the sporadic troops of Texas Rangers that are running through. It's really women and children that are left here on the frontier. So for protection, those women and children decide to uproot and move back east, get into a populated area to have more protection there. <clears throat> Native Americans know this, and so now they're trying to gain territory back, and you have a lot of um, really um, um, really brutal raids that happened during this time. October 13th, 1864 is really the last big Indian raid in Texas. The Elm Creek raid happened just 12 miles west of here. Yeah. And we've got some artifacts here that are directly related to that raid. Um, and there were supposed to be a group of Texas Rangers here at Fort Belknap when that happened, and they weren't. And you've got what some called him the uh, Paul, Re Paul Revere of the West. I believe his name was Thornton Hamby. Um, when the, while the raid, right after the raid happened, raid happened during the day. It started in the morning and it happened during the day. By, uh, I, from what I can gather, early afternoon, the raid's over with and the Indians, they've, they've burned and killed and kidnapped and they're on their way back to um, Indian territory. But the settlers are still scared out of their minds, so they're huddled down in their um, wherever shelter they could find. Finally, this guy, Thornton Hamby, is a young guy. I think that's his name, Thornton Hamby. Um, there, were, there were Thornton Hamby, Thomas Hamby, and then uh, I think the other guy was a, a doctor, uh, Thompson. Anyway, one of those guys said, okay, I'll go to Fort Belknap to, in the middle of the night. I'll go to Fort Belknap to get some help. So he rides to Fort Belknap. He gets here. The people that are here say the, sold, the, the rangers aren't here. Or No, it's actually it was a, a, supposed to be a Confederate um battalion that was here uh captain uh borland's company d was supposed to be here um anyway they get to fort belknap and realize that the soldiers aren't here they're told that they're at ville station which is um over by springtown um so he rides from fort belknap to ville station he gets to ville station they said no he's not they're not here they're actually in decatur and he goes to Decatur and finally gets word to him. And he's he was some historians have called him the Paul Revere of the West. I, I kind of question whether he made that ride between Ville Station and Decatur. Um, somebody anyway, somebody got word to yeah. Decatur. But um, anyway, and then you know they come back to Fort Belknap um, and, and what, they look at the damage that's happened at Elm Creek. And of course, this is October 1864. Well, April 1865, the Civil War is over with. But what has happened is now that your population is completely depleted, we have this kind of idea that after the Civil War is over with, that these people just came back and picked up where they left off. That's not necessarily the case. These soldiers are tired of fighting, and they don't want to move back on the frontier to fight more. So you've got a new breed of people that come out here. Now, you, if you're looking at the, the people that moved into the west, west of Fort Worth, you got a lot of people that are coming from the southern states. They're used to creating their own existence but when you're in those southern states alabama georgia um, florida there are certain resources available there that you can do that namely timber and water you move out here that's not here so the people that moved out here they've got to learn how to exist here um and not even we're not even looking at how to live comfortably we're talking just to survive and so you've got this gr group of people that start moving back out here because the population was so depleted, Young County was decommissioned as a county. There wasn't enough people here to, to um, 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 keep the county going. And it's not until 1874, and this is nine years after the Civil War is over with, that Young County is actually recommissioned as a county. Um, so, I mean, you, it shows how that struggle was to get back out yeah. here. <clears throat> but, so the Civil War is over with. In early, or late 1866... Early 1867, the federal troops show back up here to Fort Belknap. They're here for six months. While they're here, it's really the, the missions that they're looking at are, yeah, they're still um, taking a kind of a defensive position against the Indians, but they're also doing um, exploratory uh, missions, mapping rivers and stuff like that. What happens is you've got uh, the, the, the command here at Fort Belknap uh, splits the troops. Half of them go north um, into uh, Jack County, um, Clay County, um, where Buffalo Springs is. Um, and there's a, there's a Fort Buffalo Springs that was there. So what happens is they go up there and they try to establish a fort there. They have a hard time getting timber. 
making their fort. And then the other group that was here at Fort Belknap, they do these little sporadic missions where they're mapping the river going west. They decide to close Fort Belknap. And what happens is the, the soldiers that are up north of here at Buffalo Springs, they end up creating Fort Richardson. The soldiers that went west to on the clear fork of the Brazos, they end up creating Fort Griffin and Fort Belknap is closed. So if you kind of look at, at Fort Belknap's genealogy, Fort Griff or Fort Worth and Fort Graham create Fort Belknap. Fort Belknap creates Fort Richardson and Fort Griffin. That kind of gives you kind of an idea of how that. And a lot of people think that we were yeah. contemporary with those. Yeah, we're not. right. We're, we're, we we've got our own existence here. Wow. That was um, one of my questions: is how Fort Richardson played into yeah. this because it's just right up the road, but. Yeah, and, and that's what I get a lot of. Like we were an outpost of Fort Richardson, or we were the halfway stopping point between Fort Richardson and Griffin. If you look at it on the map, yeah, we're forty miles either right, way yeah, to yeah. either fort, but we we existed before them. Um, and the the mentality of the military also changed after um, Richardson and Griffin were established in Concho, and um, instead of taking a defensive position, they now they're going on the offensive. And that's mainly because Sherman was almost killed about 10 miles north of here. And I'm not Sherman, right. the, the scourge of the South. Um, <laughs> he was killed, I mean, almost killed um, 10 miles north of here. He escaped, It's um, the Warren Wagon Train Massacre. Um, he had just passed through this one area, gets to Fort Richardson. Uh, a few hours later, this rider comes into Fort Richardson and says he was with this wagon train. And the Indians just came in and massacred everybody. And so Sherman, and the reason Sherman was in Texas was because people on the frontier had been sending letters to Washington, D.C. saying, you've got to do something about the Indian problem. Sherman had gone to do this inspection to see if these charges were true. Yeah. And up until he got to Fort Richardson, he it's all made up. There's no problem out here on the frontier. Well, then this rider comes into Fort Richardson. Hey, look. So Sherman goes out and investigates. He goes up to Fort Seal. They finally round up who they think were the ones that... Um, created the Warren Wagon Train Massacre. And um, uh, that's whenever, and, and it, you see the American military might change. Wow. So now, I mean, you get the Red River War, and, and Sherman enacts the exact same plan he used on the South with the Anaconda Plan. We're going to encircle the Comanche Indians, and we're going to squeeze them in, and then we'll slash right through the middle of them. And so you had the Battle of the, um, the Red River Wars and, and the Battle of Paladura Canyon, <clears throat> all because of what almost happened to him just a few miles north wow, of here. Wow. So. Very interesting. interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> Fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. So, so I have a question for you. <clears throat> Absolutely. In, uh, what's the original Fort Belknap? What do you think, the, what was the land size of the fort itself? So, okay. So we're on about 16 acres now. If you look at the map, you look at what they had built, um, structures built on, it was about 52 acres. Okay. So, I mean, we're about a third of the size of what the fort was. Um, And that's not, they controlled everything to the river, to the south and to the west, um, but they didn't have anything built on that. I'm just talking about strictly what they built on. It was about 52 acres. Um, We could probably get more exact on that, but anyway. How do the towns, so like, you know, we have Newcastle up the, up the mm-hmm. road here. So Fort Belknap was here to kind of protect this frontier. What, how were the towns, I mean, was, was Newcastle here then? No, okay. So um, what happens is um, th- there was a, just across the highway from Fort Belknap was the town of Belknap. And that was the first county seat of Young County. Well, because of what happened in the Civil War with the population depleting and then them taking forever to get back up here, by the time Young County is recommissioned as a, in a, as a county in the 1870s, they're mining salt in Graham, okay? And they've already just, in between here and um, uh, Newcastle is a place, um, it's called Whiskey Creek. It's called Whiskey Creek for a purpose. There was a... Um, a ton of steels were found there. Evidently, it was its own little community. They had their own doctor, and you couldn't go in there unless you were invited in or whatever. And eventually, that town kind of creeps north because what happens is, um, uh, okay, so from what y'all are from Wichita Falls, Kemp and Kale, yeah, they created the Newcastle Coal Factory and they built a train, you know, created the rail that ran from Wichita Falls down to wow. Newcastle. Wow. Newcastle um, is named Newcastle because of the coal that was there. So they were exploiting the coal. So what happens is they're mining salt in Graham, and then now you've got 
coal discovered in um, Newcastle, which they knew coal was there, even the soldiers here used that coal. Um, so, and, and there's no reason to stay at Fort Belknap anymore because the military is gone. There's no money to be made here. So the popular, I mean, they, they slowly kind of um, disperse and leave right. Fort Belknap. Graham came first. If you're looking at the name, Graham came first. 1872, Graham was created. 1908 was whenever um, Newcastle was commissioned as um, incorporated as a town. Mm -hmm. But there was a town there that existed there. I mean, in Alney, north of here, um, in the 1890s, there was a cowboy that started because of a cowboy camp, a cowboy gathering area. So, um, but whenever Fort Belknap was, there was, I mean, this was it. Um, so, and not to take away from the Fort Belknap story, but so. Now we've we've through that the town the fort is dispersed mm -hmm. these towns are popping up did did oil play a part in this area yeah like it does <clears throat> up you know in, around Burke and yeah um, but only oil only played uh, so south of here in South Bend there was a lot of oil there it was fifteen miles I guess as bird flies um, but that I don't think the oil had any direct relation with the 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 um, uh, I guess sinking of Fort Belknap. I don't think that. I mean, it was really the coal in Newcastle, and because those were the big um, businesses going on, you really don't see oil playing a huge part in, I guess, Young County until really the turn of the century. Okay, so then I know I noticed like you have the artifacts of the Texas Rangers, and mm -hmm. you said they come through here. Yeah, yeah. So what about like outlaws and and those sorts of things okay. in the air? Were there any things? popular so, things that came through here so um one of the th I know whenever these guys came out um uh i was really kind of excited about this because there's one particular story that i didn't know until i moved here and started researching it so what happens is the um the town of belknap right after the soldiers leave in 1859 the town of belknap kind of encroaches onto this property and they use these buildings so then after the civil war when people start moving back out here really where the town town of Belknap is at it straddled part of, out of uh, what is the fort okay so if, if you've ever been out here you'll and if you haven't come out I just I beg you to come out and check this place out but um, whenever you come out here and I can show you where these places were at so I live here on the grounds my house is on the south end of the, of the what we call the fort grounds now where my house sits at was called the Lauderdale Hotel there was a building there it was the Lauderdale Hotel um Right next to the Lauderdale Hotel was what was called Holly's Saloon. Okay, Holly's Saloon was it, not a saloon like we think, a Wild West Saloon. It was more of a general store that had a bar and served, you know, sold liquor um, or spirits. Um, and this is in the 1870s. Um, so there's a guy inside Holly's Saloon. His name is Buffalo Bill, not the Buffalo Bill Cody. He was evidently an outlaw that was also a buffalo hunter or whatever. He's sitting at the bar, um, and then there's a sheriff here in Young County. He's a young, very, very young sheriff. I want to say 24 years old, but evidently very good because uh, the anybody that lived in Young County loved him, and, and the way the story plays out kind of tells you why. So what happens is um, and the sheriff's name is Sheriff Kirk. Sheriff Kirk has a warrant for the arrest of this Buffalo Bill. Um it's a, I'm guessing it's murder charge because why else would you risk your life to go after a guy like a buffalo hunter? The so sheriff Kirk walks into Holly's saloon and tells um, um, uh, Buffalo Bill, "I've got a warrant for your arrest." Buffalo Bill is sitting at the bar. Either his buffalo gun is on the bar or in his lap. Either way, it's pointed at the door. Buffalo Bill, Sheriff Kirk says, I'm here for your arrest. Buffalo Bill says, sorry, and squeezes off around and shoots Sheriff Kirk, gets him in the gut. As Sheriff Kirk is falling, he pulls his pistol out and shoots Buffalo Bill. Both of them die. Hmm. Now, the interesting part of the story, one of the interesting parts of the story is because Sheriff Kirk was so loved, he was buried in the cemetery over here and then reinterred later in Graham. And they named the highest uh, point in the county Kirk Mount. Okay. Because either because Sheriff Kirk was so loved or because Buffalo Bill was so hated, 
we don't really know what happened with Buffalo Bill's body. Some say he was buried in an unmarked grave at the Belknap Cemetery. Others say he was drugged down to the river and they let the coyotes have him. So, um, anyway, that kind of leads to why y'all are here. There's this interesting phenomenon that happens where Holly Saloon sits at. There's an outline in the ground there. What happens is during the spring, whenever all the grass starts turning green, this little outline stays dormant. It stays brown. And then during the fall, when the grass starts going dormant, this little outline stays green for just a little bit longer. And any time of the year, you can walk over there and see where this little outline is. Now, we had some work done um, in our cemetery, um, some archaeological work done in our cemetery. <laughs> you say archaeological work in a cemetery, people get really curious. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Now, what happened is um, that cemetery was still active whenever we first I first got out here. Um, but we also don't know where all, there's no cemetery plot, so we don't know where people are buried out there. And we needed to do some kind of archaeological work to make sure if we're putting a new hole in the ground, we're not digging up an old one. So anyway, what, and it was Texas Tech um, came out and did this. So while they're here, the professor, um, who was um, just absolutely loved history and loved, we, we just, we got along really good. Um, Dr. Tamara Walters out of, out of Texas Tech. Um, I said, I got something I'm really curious about. I need you to come look at it. And so I took her over there where this outline in the ground of the saloon was at. And I told her what was happening. You know, I, I explained to her how the grass stayed dormant and then how it stayed green. And I told her what lived, I mean, what was there, that there was a saloon. And I, I kind of, in my mind, trying to make, to reason with this, um, I was thinking, okay, so they had spirits, alcohol or whatever. Maybe whenever they cleaned the bar, that's where the spirits fell into the ground. That was in the 1870s, though. We've had 150 years since then. The soil would have replenished itself, and that's exactly what she said to me. She said, it's not the soil doing that. Are there any foundations underneath there? So we did a we did a um, little archaeological dig there, and there's nothing. There's absolutely nothing in the ground, no rocks, no timber, nothing in that soil that would, no foundation at all, that would lead you to say, that's why this grass is, is staying this way. Um, I've always absolutely thought that was the most amazing yeah. thing in the world. That's pretty neat. Yeah, it is. It's, it's really curious. Yeah, it, it's it's really well, and and um, whenever y'all showed up, to, I was mowing or whatever, and I was yeah. over there mowing. I thought, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to mow over this. <laughs> <laughs> Better stop. But yeah. um, anyway, so I think I got one part of it mowed, but you can still see it. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah, we could see the outline. It, it, it's amazing. It's amazing, and that we haven't been able to explain what's going on there at all. And now, of course, around Halloween, whenever people come out here, I love to tell them that story, and I love to show them that. And there were two people that died right here. Um, could that be the reason, you know, we, I don't think we'll ever know, you know, yeah. but right. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a neat, it's a neat little, and one of the funny things is my house is right next to that. Both my kids, I've got five kids, their bedrooms are on that end of the house and they hate that story. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, it's, it's a, it's a good way to get them to behave. So. <laughs> I'd like you to share two stories with us. One, okay. the first one is... There's a gentleman, and I don't remember his name, and you can tell us, that truly was a Native American ambassador. Okay, uh, uh, Robert Neighbors. Yes. Okay. So Robert Neighbors was, when I was talking about the Indian reservation system and, and um, the reservation closing, Robert Neighbors um, was an Indian agent, which was, he was a liaison between the federal government and the Indian um, uh, Indian tribes or whatever. Of the heroes of the frontier, in my mind, Robert Neighbors is one of those. He's right up there because he accomplished what they said could not be accomplished. He got, and when you're looking at the reservations, the lower reservation was successful. That was under the direction of Robert Neighbors. Upper reservation was under the direction of John Baylor. Okay, and this this all this story all comes together. Well, um, because of them storming the reservation, what we call the reservation war, because of that, the federal government decides to close the reservations. And Robert Neighbors, who had served his life 
Um, I mean, he was arrested. He was in uh, Parodi Castle in, in Mexico during the Mex- uh, Texas Revolution. I mean, he his whole life had been in the service of the state of Texas, his whole adult life. Um, when they decided to close the reservations, and Robert Neighbors was loved by every Native American, um, whether Comanche or Kiowa or in, I mean, even today he's loved because he was so good at what he did. So what happens is the reservations are closed. Robert neighbors assist in taking them north to Indian territory. Well, whenever they get to Indian territory, Robert neighbors is now retiring from public life. He's done and he's going to go to San Antonio to live with his wife and his brand new baby daughter. He gets, comes on his way to San Antonio. He stops here at Fort Belknap, which was kind of his central location. Um, he stops here at Fort Belknap, and um, he is finishing up some, some of his affairs, some paperwork and stuff. He walks outside of this office, and somebody yells his name. So he turns, and he looks, and he's shot in the back, killed. Now, um, in, in kind of this story, there, there's, there's a lot that we don't know. There's some legend that goes with it and stuff. One of the stories that goes with it is that his body laid in the street all afternoon because nobody wanted to go help him because they didn't want to be seen as Indian sympathizer because the two men that killed him were friends of John Baylor who hated Robert neighbors. The two, the only two men that were brought up on charges were, um, we know cohort cohorts with, um, um, John Baylor. So, um, anyway, and kind of with his body laying in the street, this, the way this story goes, whether it's true or not, I don't know if we'll ever know. It was, a uh, um, a uh, slave went and got picked his body up, and he's buried over. Uh, Robert Neighbors is buried over in our cemetery over here. Um, and the two men that were brought up on charges, the dro- uh, um, char- charges were dropped. So was was he Native American or no? Was- no, okay. uh, Robert Neighbors was not Native American. Um, he just knew the plight of that. He understood more than he was a very progressive thinker for that time, um, and um, he was a smart aleck too. You read some of his letters. I mean, this guy was, he was very, very quick with his tongue, but it was very intellectual way. He, I mean, it just kind of blows me away. One of those guys you just admire how, how good they are, but he, yeah, he was, um, killed over here. And, um, uh, I don't, I want to say it was Caddo, but it might not be. Um, there was one native American tribe that every year would come out and do a, um, uh, ceremony at his grave. I think they stopped doing that in 2001, 2000, mm. somewhere around there. Um, I would like to get that started back up. But he's buried, um, <clears throat> and his grave is more of a mausoleum. It's above ground. It's, you know, rock, and it's got a, a large slab on top of it. Mm. Yeah, we were able to yeah. find it. Yeah, yeah sure it's, it's the easiest one yeah. to find. I'm Absolutely sure easiest one to find. And there is some question on whether he's actually buried there. That marker that's on that, it's the 1936 mm-hmm. state markers put there. Whenever they decided to put it there, they didn't know what grave was his, so they asked some of the old timers. Um, and this one old timer just kind of said he's buried in the the grave twenty feet north of the Newhouse brothers. Well, we knew the Newhouse brothers. If you go out there, where right, this marker is at, the is there. Yeah. Um, so I mean, uh, that's how they identified the grave. It wasn't an exact science; it was oral history. So um, anyway, that's yeah. Robert Neighbors. That's that's a very interesting story. The other one I want you to share with us is. <laughs> You know, John Wayne being, you know, in the Western movie uh, genre, um, there was a movie. In fact, it was interesting when you and I were talking about two weeks prior to that, I watched a movie called The Sons of Katie Elder. I had never watched it before in my life, Um, found it very interesting. And so how does that movie play into this area? Okay. Um, We have a, a particular artifact here at the the fort that is uh, probably the most macabre um, artifact we've got here. So the Sons of Katie Elder is based on a story that happened in Graham called, and, it, um, and it's based on the Marlowe brothers. Okay. What happens is there's five Marlowe brothers. Historians debate and you can tell where somebody lives on how either Marlowe brothers were all bad or they were all good. Um, if you're from Oklahoma, they were all good. If you're from down here, they were all bad. Um, but what happens is you've got these five brothers. As a historian, as somebody who researched this, and I try to do it, we can never be completely unbiased about anything. You try to be as unbiased as you can. From what I've researched, it seems like you had the one brother, the little brother, who was the bad apple. Um, that's kind of what I've seen. I can see both sides of the argument. Yeah. 
But kind of what I see is this one um, brother is the bad apple. And what happens is um, there's an incident in Oklahoma um, where he's accused of horse stealing and then somehow murder. And I don't know the story of the actual charge where the first charges come from. And I think murder is thrown right. in there. Anyway, what happens is, is the, the Marlowe brothers, their mom lives um, where Possum Kingdom Lake is right now. Okay. And um, so they're the they're moving down here to be with their mom. Well, what happens is that charge that's on the little brother gets attached to the big brothers. So now they want all the Marlowe brothers. Them, yeah. Okay. Well, the Marlowe brothers are down here. And this is really, I mean, this story is gets so convoluted. So what happens is... Um, the Marlowe brothers have a friend and I can't remember. I don't, I should have read this before. They've got a friend and one law enforcement person. I don't know if it's the sheriff or the city marshal or something like that is a friend of the Marlowe brothers. They're also friends with the newspaper editor. Okay. But you've also got a federal marshal and another law enforcement officer that are doing everything they can to, um, arrest the, um, the Marlowe brothers. So what happens is um, the Marlowe brothers are arrested and they're put in jail. This becomes problematic for the vigilantes because the newspaper reporter lives next door to the jail. Oh, wow. Okay, so the Marlowe brothers are put into jail. They escape from the jail by cutting a stone. And the jail is still there. It was a two-story jail. They were on the upper floor. The top floor is not there, but the jail is still there in, yeah. in, um, in Graham. They evidently knock one of the rocks out of the wall and they all escape and then they go to their mom's house um, because they're innocent. I mean, from their point of view, they're innocent. So they go to their mom's house. Well, the um, law enforcement officer that is their friend wants to get to them before the other ones do to tell them, hey, you've got to give yourself up. They're going to come out here and kill you. Well, while he's there talking to him, the, the other law enforcement show up and there's a shootout that happens. One of these law enforcement agents is killed. Well, now that's got more people mad in town. Mm, sure. Okay, so the Marlowe brothers are rearrested and put back in the jail. Now, remember, he's lived. The jail is right next door to the newspaper man, who right. is the friends of the Marlowe brothers. Right. This vigilante mob wants to go in there and kill the Marlowe brothers to lynch them inside the jail. But they've got to be quiet when they do that <laughs> because the newspaper man lives right next door. <laughs> so what happens is they go in and um, try to lynch them. Marlowe brothers put up a fight and they can't do it. Okay, so. Vigilante mob leaves. A few days later, they decide, come up with this plan. And if you've watched the Sons of Katie Elder, you you'll you yeah. this is kind of the big scene in there. Um the the marshals show up with a couple of hacks, a couple of wagons to carry them. They're gonna take them to into uh, to another town for federal protection. Um some say they were just going to Jacksboro, others say they were going to Dallas, some say they were going to Weatherford. Okay. Um, different reports. Uh, I can't remember which one was the actual one. Anyway, they were taking them to another town for, for federal protection. They get in the wagons, and it, it, with the interviews and everything, you kind of know that the Marlowe brothers know that this is not on the up and up mm-hmm. because it's cold. They're not given jackets or anything like that to carry. Um, they're under protection. Um, they're, they've got guns all around them. They're shackled together, and they're shackled two by two. This plays into the story. They're shackled two by two. You got two brothers shackled to each other in two different wagons. So what happens is they get just west of Graham at Dry Creek, and if you've seen the Sons of Katie Elder, this big ambush scene. Right. So um, the the Marlowe brothers are attacked by this vigilante mob, and this fight ensues. What happens is so the, the, they're chained two by two. Each brother. Um, that ch- is chained to another brother that dies or whatever. Okay. And so the brothers that are living grab a stone or a rock. And I've heard it two different ways. They b- bash the chains to come free or they bash their <laughs> dead brother's leg to, to come free or whatever. Wow. Um, both of them do that. Anyway, in this ensuing firefight that happens because the, 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 They've got a friend in the law enforcement that's trying to help protect them, but the vigilante mob's trying to kill them. So there is a gunfight. And then, of course, the Marlowe brothers end up with their own guns in the middle of this fight. Well, in the middle of this uh, fight, this man is killed who's part of the mob. His name is Franz Harmonson, Franz Harmonson, whatever. Um, the way that's connected here directly with Fort Belknap is we have his suit that he was wearing when he was killed over in yeah. 
it's on display over there and i've got the whole story with it and everything yeah, um and the uh, he was um the the label that was on there originally which i pretty much just copied it um redid it it said that he was shot between the eyes the newspaper article says he had a lung shot under his right arm mm -hmm. and then he was also shot in the head um if you open the pull the arm up on there you can see a hole there and there is something inside the jacket that you could easily say is blood yeah. so that's why i say it's the most macabre whether it's blood or not and whether it might be a moth hole or something like yeah. that i don't know um anyway but his daughters are the ones that actually gave the suit to the wow. museum so that's uh, that's that's an interesting yeah story. so if you watch the sons of katie elder it's based and, and you know at john wayne i mean there's two movies that john wayne did that are based on here the other one is the searchers um the elm creek raid that i talked about october 13th 1864 mm -hmm. that's based on um the elm creek raid uh, the searchers is based on the elm creek raid uh Britt johnson's family was taken killed and taken captive and um he goes and ends up getting his family back and this is 1864 here's the most amazing thing about the story Britt Johnson is a black man. Britt Johnson is a slave. But he's really more of a business partner with his owner. Wow. And his business partner allows him and actually supplies him to go get it. So Britt Johnson not only gets his family back, but he's also credited with getting a lot of other captives back too. So sure. um, anyway, so yeah, John Wayne uh, and John Ford also, you know, working with John Wayne, right. he knew the stories because yeah. there's so many. And I mean, there's there's a reason for Larry McMurtry writes Lonesome Dove, you know, right. Um uh, Charles Goodnight and and August Charles Goodnight and um, Oliver Loving. Whenever you portray them as fictional characters, well, that's Augustus McCurry and Woodrow Call from Lonesome Dove. I mean, that's and Charles Goodnight was sworn in as a Texas Ranger here at Fort Belknap. So that history runs really, really deep. Um, and they have Texas towns named after them. Oh yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, and and um, the. Um, uh, I mean, this was the start of the Good Night Loving Trail, uh, Fort Belknap was. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that, but uh, th th their ties are a absolutely... Um, Charles Goodnight would not be Charles Goodnight had Fort Belknap not been here. Because it's here he decides to go and talk to Oliver Loving, who's the older one, yeah. um, who, who was a, a, did cattle drives. He goes and asks Oliver Loving, do you mind helping me with this cattle drive? Oliver Loving says, yeah. And so, you know, they meet be here at Fort Belknap to do that. Charles Goodnight's first wife that he met, um, or wife, his wife that he met, he met her here. She was a, a, she ends wow. up becoming a teacher in Weatherford. So, um, so I wanted to backtrack a second. Okay. So the John Wayne movie, The Searchers, is based on the real story of what happened at Little Lamb. Is that what? Uh, at Elm Creek, yeah. Or, it, yeah well, it, Elm it's Creek. A, okay. So The Searchers is based on um, uh, the Elm Creek raid and a little bit on um, Cynthia Ann Parker. Uh, the story of Cynthia Ann Parker, who I mean, that has absolute yeah. ties here too, because right. yeah, Charles Goodnight actually is um, one of the Texas Rangers. That the the so when Cynthia Ann Parker is recaptured, she's re, she's recaptured in the Battle of the Peace River, which was not a battle and it was not at the Peace River. <laughs> um, it was a the Mule Creek, which is a tributary there, um, and it was not a battle at all. It was a, a yeah, it was an absolute slaughter. But Charles Goodnight was part of the Texas Rangers. They left from Fort Belknap to go to the Pease River. They recapture Cynthia Ann Parker and her daughter, Prairie Flower. They take her to Camp Cooper, which would have been the next fort in line from here. She tries to escape from there. Um, they bring her here because they're taking her to Fort Worth to reintroduce her with the Parker family. Um, once they get her here, it's actually the officer's wives and laundresses that get her cleaned up and a little bit more tame and so she's here for at least a night before really? they go yeah go to um, that's awesome yeah, yeah. so i mean it, it all it all intertwined. and here's what you want to talk about these um these ironies of history like with the canon the only time it's used um, right. it was opposite of what it was supposed to be one of the, these little ironies of history charles goodnight's part of the um mob that goes and gets or the rangers i guess i should clarify that part of the texas rangers that go in um Recapture Cynthia Ann Parker. And a recapture is definitely in quotations. Right. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah. but, well, you know, that's the thing. Rescue. It was not a rescue. Uh, According yeah. to her, I, it, for, through her um, point of view, it was not a rescue. But Charles Goodnight's part of the Rangers that go and, and um, rescues, recaptures Cynthia Ann Parker. They, that's Quanah Parker's mom. Right. I, I know the relationship between my wife and my son. 
if there's one person in your life that you hate, it's going to be the person that does something wrong to your mama, mm -hmm. right? So for the one person in the world that you would think Quanta Parker would hate, it would be a guy like Charles Goodnight. Now, here's the irony of that. Why does Quanta Parker go to, why does Quanta Parker go onto I mean, the reservation? Um, the reason he goes onto the reservation is because Charles Goodnight convinces him to do that because they have become friends. So you think the one, that's that irony that I'm talking about. You would think that one person that um, you would hate, they would never get along. They end up becoming friends. So much so, and Charles Goodnight admits his wrongs. He knows what's happening and he tries everything he can to correct the, the situation with the Buffalo and with the Native Americans. And he becomes friends with um, Quanta Parker and finally convinces Quanta Parker to go onto the reservation. So, how long did you say Cynthia Parker was here? You said a day, and yeah, a day or two. I don't, I, I, I wouldn't say it's more than 48 hours because they didn't keep her in one, they got her to Fort, they wanted to get her to her family. And to finish that story out, I've got a picture hanging up here of uh, the famous picture of Cynthia Ann Parker holding prairie flower. Um, I know this is a, a kind of a family thing. That picture to me is Cynthia Ann Parker giving the white people the proverbial middle finger because what's she doing? She's breastfeeding her yep, and yep. you did not do that oh, at that yeah. time. You absolutely did. And she's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm Indian yep. and this is my life. And I mean, she's, you can tell she's miserable in that picture. One of the things yeah, I would see it. Oh yeah. One of the things I would suggest that you do is look at her hands. Look how big her daggum hands are. You can tell she's worked oh, with yeah. her hands for yeah. so long. So anyway, and she's reintroduced with her family. That picture is taken in Fort Worth. Um, she's reintroduced with her family. And then two years later, she's dead from depression, mm -hmm. broken heart. I mean, she just could not. And here's the sad thing about her fam, her, her, all she wanted to do is be reunited with her boy. She wanted to be reunited with Quanta Parker. She dies two years later. She's buried um, on the... Uh, Cherokee Henderson County line a little cemetery there then she's dug up exhumed and reinterred in Fort Worth at the Parker Cemetery there Quanta Parker's last wish is for his mama to be buried next to him yeah. so whenever he dies they exhume her and reinter her at, at Fort Seal uh, on Chief Snow up there Chief Seal up there she does not get rest until she's reintroduced with her son yeah. and it's I mean she even in death yeah she yeah. still so it's just one of those sad things that um, wow you just uh, and it, that's that's why I love history that to me that I mean those connections history is not just about who and what we really got to look at the why mm -hmm. yeah. I mean because I mean, there's no reason to, to research history if you're not looking at why something happened the way it did so sure. um, and that's kind of my mission here so. I, I wish that you know See, a lot of people don't like history. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I, I absolutely love history, but I wish that everybody had somebody like you to talk to that was <laughs> actually yeah. so, yeah. I mean, you just well, tell and, the and story. Kind of and my approach, awesome. whenever, it, even like I'll go to the schools and I'll be dressed in, you know, cavalry uniform and everything, and I'll talk with the kids and stuff. But one of the things that I'm careful not to do whenever I'm talking with the kids is I don't start off with names and dates. Because if you're talking history with somebody and you start off with names and dates, their yeah, eyes glaze over, yeah. and that's all yeah. they think that history is, and it's not. It's so so so. It's, it's so I always, and you always try to find something relatable, um, something that a, a child likes to do now, and look at that through the through its development through history. Um, how did they get to where they like that now? Because um, every person has a history, and one little part of that history is removed. Everybody's history has changed. So everything comes together for that one. Um, and anyway, that's that's kind of how my approach to history is, is more looking at the why. You, ha you, you need to know the who and the when and the what happened, but why it happened is, um, and what happened, the, the what of it is debatable. Um, the why it happened is debatable to a point, but we're not going to learn. And then the result of what happened um, after that, you know the, the the domino effect that happens mm -hmm. there. So uh, that that's kind of my approach to history because um, I do uh, w when people come in, it's usually the very first thing that I do is I tell them how the museum's laid out, and then I ask them where they're from. And if they're from the Metroplex, I'll tell them, okay. So if you're familiar with Fort Worth, and I explain that part of it, and then they so now it's relatable. Now it's it, you know yeah. they take possession of it. So 
that's kind of that's kind of my approach. To I will say that's one of the things when I first met you, you could tell you had a passion yeah, for this definitely. area. <laughs> well, you really could, and I think a lot of I wished a lot of more museums would have well, that passion. Well, I I, I love it. I, um, if if you know, I, I didn't want to teach in the classroom. I wanted right. to, te- but but now I've gotten to the point that, of course, I've got five kids. And they hate history. <laughs> so, yeah. anyway. So, I was going to say, I like how it came full circle for us because we we actually investigated Mule Creek at the battle. Yeah, we sure did. Yep. And I had no clue about No, I didn't either. None, I had nothing. No nope. clue. I, I mean, I knew about the cavalry coming out there. Well, not the cavalry, the Texas Rangers. I knew about them coming out there and how they air quote, captured, recaptured. Sure, sure. Yeah. But I had no clue about that. Yeah, I didn't that. either. Yeah. Like I said, we we investigated the Mule Creek for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we had access out there, and then we also go out to the Copper Break State Park. Also, awesome. yeah, yeah. And they had that, the uh, Cynthia Ann Parker, uh, I guess, air, little area yeah, for area. her. Yeah, mm-hmm. That had some stuff, mm-hmm. but yeah, that, that picture gets me every single time. And, and it's it. something, it, that, that is one of those p- pictures that it just says so much. Um there's so little going on there, but it just says so yeah. much. So, yeah. yeah, you know, and, and um, you know, like uh, when you look at history, uh, so the Battle of the Peace River, mm-hmm. the reason we call it the Battle of the Peace River solely depends on one man telling that story, Sol Ross. You look at the first time he tells the story, and then you look at the last time he tells the story, it's a completely different story. What happens is um, as he's running for political office, the story gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, here's the thing. He's so Ross. Who are we to question him whenever he says that? Yeah. And he was an eyewitness. That's a firsthand account. Yeah. That's a primary source right yep. there. Yeah. And and really with that, there's a great book talking about that. It's called Myth, Memory, and Massacre by uh, Paul, Paul Carlson. Um, and, and another gentleman wrote the book. And really what they do, it's not a retelling of the, the Battle of the Peace River. It's a breakdown of how that story has been written through history. It's the historiography of it. So um, it's 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 really fascinating. And I, I always say that, you know, my wife says that I'm a crusher of souls because people come out here and they want to hear the, <laughs> they want to hear these stories. Um, I was told this and I was told this and I was and I, I'm always. Um, yeah, that's yeah, not no. really how. And, and it kind of here's the thing is um, if it's your granddaddy that told you that story. That's the gospel truth. Yeah, right. You know, you don't, you don't, in case in point, had this gentleman come out here, um, probably in his 40s, um, he came out here with a friend. The gentleman in his 40s had come out here as a child um, and come out numerous times. He was, he's from around here. And he comes out with a friend who's never been out here before. And as they're walking through the museum, I'm listening to him tell stories and I'm cringing. I'm just, <laughs> oh, oh. Well, finally, they get over to where I'm at and we start talking. And um, listening to their conversation, I realized that he came out here with his granddaddy a lot. Um, and his granddaddy told him stories and stuff like that. Now, I'll say this. Those are those need to be treasured memories. He needs to have those memories about his granddad. Anyway, he gets up to talk to me. And um, what he asked me, he says, tell, me, tell my friend here why the wall is so short around the fort. <laughs> and I, I've been through this. I've been down this road before. Yeah, yeah. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. Um, you tell him why it's so short, and I'll just kind of throw in some some historical facts there. Then you have to remember this is a sound reasoning man because he's able to tie his shoes and drive to the fort. So he's able to think for himself. He turns to his buddy and he says, the reason the wall is so short around the fort is be- they didn't need a tall wall because Indians were scared to jump rock walls. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this man, his, but and I think what happens is he's out here with his granddaddy, and his granddaddy's telling him all these stories, and his granddaddy it probably gets tired of him asking questions, right? Yep. And so he's going to pull his leg, and mm-hmm. he tells little, yeah, the yeah. younger version. He says, "Yeah, Indians were scared to jump rock walls." Yeah, and that man believed it until he's an adult. <laughs> And that's why my wife calls me a crusher of souls <laughs> because, I, well, okay, listen, guy. And I didn't. I did not chastise him about that. I said, "No, actually, the I don't know if they were scared to jump rock walls or not, but 
the wall was built in 1936. It had nothing to do with Indians or anything like that. <laughs> I did not say that's the dumbest <laughs> thing I've ever heard. But you kind of get where, and I've yeah. heard so many oh, of them. I'm sure. You know, I, I just and when people, and I kind of I don't want to. I kind of like it when people argue with me on points of history because then it really gets me to thinking and, and being... But one of them they argue with me a lot about is that we are contemporary, that we are just the outpost for Fort Richardson right. and Fort Griffin. Yeah. Um, because in their mind's eye, that's how they've always seen it. And yeah. they don't know the, the, the true story. So, um, And that, that's also another reason for the upgrade in here to tell uh, those different sure. stories and stuff. So anyway... Well, he's told us the story of the saloon. I right. think we have one more. Right. Yeah, yeah, and that was one one of the things we were talking about. Well, okay, you know, we're all about history, mm-hmm. and you know, we have the the, but we're also military paranormal. Yeah. Right. So, how does the paranormal tie into Fort Belknap? Well, I know he told us the one about. He told us the, the one about the mm-hmm. saloon. So we know there was deaths there. Yep. As you were talking, I was thinking. This was an active fort. Yes. So people are, due to illnesses, going oh, yeah, to die on this property. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, you're going to have those folks that have passed away on the property as well. Yep. But if you will, share the story with us after, um, I believe you said it was the early 1900s, yeah, right? Yeah, uh, uh, over at the Powder Magazine. Correct. Um, and I swear, and I looked for it, I can't find it. I swear I've read this in a newspaper article. Um, and I don't know if maybe that's or it was a retelling of this story. Right. I don't think I don't know that it was the actual event that happened. It seems like it was, but I, anyway, I read the story. So the Powder Magazine is the only building um, that was left completely intact after the soldiers left because the, the people that lived here just dismantled these; they'd fallen down to ruin. But the Powder Magazine was left fully intact. Well, the way this newspaper article um, read was that evidently the powder magazine was still used to store powder, whether that was left over from the soldiers or whether the local people, because it was a powder magazine, left powder there. And what kids would do is go and get powder and make their own little fireworks, you know, set it off with whatever they could. Well, evidently this teenage boy was in there getting powder. Something happened and there was an explosion and he was killed and it knocked a part of the the wall out and you can see where that part is at. Anyway, he was, he was killed in that explosion. Um, and so when we talk about deaths here on the fort, that's one of the most traumatic in, in the sheriff or whatever sure. it is. So, um, and, and that's a, I, I looked, I can't find that story. I know I've read it. I just, it was in a newspaper article. I don't remember if it was a retelling or the original, but that's what happened is he went in there getting some powder or whatever he was doing. In sure. there. there was an explosion and he was killed there. Um, so, um, Anyway, so what year did you say that was? It was in the early 1900s. 1900s okay. I, I, I can't uh, put a specific date. It was no later than the 19-teens. Okay. Um, it was a, a, a long time ago, but it wasn't contemporary with the fort. You know, and that's another thing. Um, yeah, like you say, there were sicknesses and illnesses out here. There were people that died out here, soldiers sure. that died out sure. here. Um, case in point, um, when I talk about the hospital... Behind the hospital was the dead house, or what we consider a morgue right. now. And then a hundred mile, a hundred yards beyond that would have been the cemetery. And we had a military cemetery out here, and there were soldiers that were buried in that cemetery. Well, what happened in 1907? The federal government came in to Fort Belknap um, and exhumed those bodies to reinter them at national cemeteries, um, the national cemeteries down in San Antonio, not just here, but to uh, all the other folks right. too. Well, I've looked at um, the research on them coming in and exhuming these bodies. And they're, man, this is one of those, like how they found Robert Neighbor's grave just by oral history. That's how they figured out where these. So what happens is there's a list of men we know that died here at Fort Belknap. Federal ones. Um, or soldiers that, that died here at Fort Belknap. Well, whenever they came to exhume the bodies, I don't remember the number. Uh, they were going to dig up 28 graves and, and exhume them. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the graves that they dug up had two bodies in it. <laughs> so oh and, and what happens, and, and here's one of the reasons that you research history for yourself. Conventional wisdom, the stories in Young County of that cemetery um, said that the soldiers were buried with white wooden crosses there and that it was just and that those bodies were exhumed and reinterred at Sam Houston National Cemetery in San Antonio okay that's what just the way the story's always been told well I start researching it on my own 
Um, there's two little things here that are just mind blowing to me. The Sam Houston National Cemetery didn't start burying people until 1928. 1928, 1921, 1920s. Mm -hmm. They didn't start burying people there, but yet these bodies were exhumed in 1907. So I thought, how does that work? Come to find out, there's actually two national cemeteries in San Antonio. There's a Sam Houston National Cemetery, and then just south of town, there's a smaller one called the San Antonio National Cemetery. In that, and I've got the, the uh, had a guy take pictures for me. In that cemetery, there is a common grave that has all the soldiers from Fort Belknap, oh, no, most of the soldiers from Fort Belknap buried into it. But then there's also two separate headstones for individuals. One of them, his name is John Bolger. He was with the Second Dragoons. He died in 1854 out here. Now, this is interesting, okay? If they were buried, oh, okay, well, so I'll get to that in just a second. Um, John Bolger, his headstones at the San Antonio National Cemetery. In the 1940s, this road, um, there's a dead-end road west of the fort. They were doing construction work on that, that, and whoever was riding on the uh, maintainer, uh, the road grader, got off to smoke a cigarette, and he looked over, and he sees this stone. And he's oh, that's an interesting stone. He flips it over, and it says, John Bolger died 1854, Second Dragoons, Fort Belknap. Okay. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Okay. Well, but hold on. <laughs> hold on. This gets great. This is. I mean, that, that's good. But this was great. In 2014, I'm on, on Facebook. I'm, I've got a on a bunch of military history mm -hmm. pages and yeah. stuff. So um, the um, Second Cavalry Museum, the Reed Second Cavalry Museum, is in Vilsick, Germany. It's there because after World War II, the the uh, okay. and I guess that was the home of the Second Cavalry for a while or something like that. So the Reed Second Cavalry Museum is in Vilsick, Germany. In 2014, you know they're posting information on their on their Facebook page. I read this one, and it is a picture of John Bolger's headstone. His headstone is in the museum in Vilsick, Germany. The reason it's there is because that guy that was on the road maintainer, and I get chill bumps when I tell the story. The guy that was on that road maintainer. Um, when he found that, he knew it was an artifact. Well, this wasn't an active museum at the time, so he takes it to the closest military museum, which is Fort Seal. He takes it to Fort Seal. Fort Seal says, we're not Second Cavalry Museum, but we'll get it to him. And so now that is in Ville St. Oh, Germany. wow. That's now, and, and, he, okay, and, and to tie this all in, conventional wisdom, the story, the oral history that's been told of the Fort Belknap Cemetery is that they were buried with wooden crosses. That shows that that's not the truth that there was an actual stone there. And also, it said that they were buried at the Sam Houston National Cemetery. Well, not true. Right. Um, and so you do research on your own. Another interesting thing with that cemetery is we know, okay, I don't believe they got all the bodies. And the reason I say that is because um, the only women recognized by the military in the 1850s were the laundresses. Not even officers' wives were recognized by the military. Mm. And when I say recognized by the military, what I mean is they got to use the commissary. They got um, pay. They, they were guaranteed pay, actually. Um, so what happens is these laundresses are paid a dollar a day to do soldiers' laundries or whatever. If a soldier gets court-martialed, what's the first thing that they take from you? They take your you pay. pay. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you take that from the soldier, you're also taking it from the laundress. So that laundress was going to be paid anyway, whether you were court-martialed or not. She was guaranteed her pay. Also, recognized by the military means that she got to see the post-surgeon. Okay, there's this one particular laundress, and her name's real simple. It's like Mary Adams or something like that. Um, she dies while in the care of the post-surgeon. She's not buried in the civilian cemetery that we have over here. I think she was buried in that military cemetery. Now, whether she was that extra body or whether they just didn't yeah. get her, hmm. but whenever they came and dug... They swore they only got soldiers. Wow. It was, and they got 28 of them. But we know one of them had an extra body in it. So wow. huh. however, however that worked. But anyway, that's... So I really think that where that cemetery is... And I know the guy that owns that property. Yeah. Um, he's a great guy. He's an um, Army guy. Okay. Uh, re retired uh, captain in the Army. He um, uh, has his uh, bachelor's in, in um, history. And I believe he's working on his PhD in... Um, uh, it is, he might be working. No, he just got his master's in divinity, so he's going to uh, Bible college. Great guy, absolutely great guy. Wow. And he, um, uh, 
is just absolutely fascinated with that story. Wow. And I, I've done some overlays of the historic map. There's only one map of the fort. I've done some historical overlays onto Google Earth to try to triangulate. The map doesn't mm-hmm. show the cemetery, but we can kind of guess where the cemetery was because of other uh, forts and cemeteries, yeah. how, how they designed them. And it was about 100 yards because of disease and stuff. They kept them far away. So we kind of have an area leading up until I really started researching this. The only, the best guess we had was over in that area. I see. Uh, that was oral history. Just right. some, all, is over in that area. Um, and I'm really, we're really trying to triangulate to see if we can figure out where, um, where that cemetery was at. And I mean, I really, I honestly believe that there's more than to that story than what, what we know. Did you, did they, did they? What's the cemetery? They exhumed the bodies in 1907. I mean, it's a good chance if you could find the location, you might even be able to use it. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it would it, it would be um, it would be fascinating, you know. And, and I've I've heard that this the the story of the a lot of these um, stories I've heard told many different ways. The way I'm telling you is the way that I've researched it. I've heard the story and then I get in and try to dig it out myself. Yeah. There are things that you know, some there are things that could vary, but. Like with that, it was 1907. They exhumed the bodies. Um, we know how many bodies they got out of there. We know where they were buried at. And that was the only reason we know exactly where they're buried at is because I started researching it a couple of years ago because sure. everybody assumed it was Sam Houston. And I've even seen published material that says they were buried at the Sam Houston National Cemetery. What that is is somebody just believing somebody else's word for it. It's not doing the research themselves. Right. Um, and the reason I found out they didn't start burying bodies in Sam Houston National Cemetery until the 1920s was Wikipedia. Just a quick search. I wanted to see if there was a list of, of people on there. Right. And I saw that and I thought, well, I guess this is a the end of the road for this cemetery. So <laughs> yeah. uh, and I thought, well, where in the crap are they? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. And then I kind of looked, oh, okay. And um, and I did find a, I don't know if it was on Find a Grave or um, Ancestry or something like that. I saw where there was a list of names. Okay, well, now I've got a list of names that says they're at the San, uh, San Antonio National Cemetery. But I'm not going to believe that until I have eyewitness proof. I want a picture of it. And through uh, linking up of friends, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. somebody was just happened to be right there in the area and went took pictures of wow. it and, and found it. So. so why were there two bodies that were in Because I think what happens is... Um, so John Bolger was one of them. I think his headstone in 1907 was still probably standing up. And then whenever they moved the body, they just discarded the headstone and it wasn't found until the 1940s. And probably the other name, um, probably the same thing was he had a stone headstone, um, that was still, and it could still be laying out there. Um, we don't know, but that's why, um, that's how we know. And the rest of them, maybe they did have wooden crosses. I don't know. They just didn't have any way to, they didn't identify them. They're just buried in a common grave. And they're actually, um, it's not just Fort Belknap soldiers in that common grave. I mean, it's it's a couple of other forts that are, are buried there. So um, anyway, it's fa- fascinating yeah, stuff. This is definitely. Well, we've been going at this quite a while. <laughs> I know, it's, it's um, interesting. It's Yeah, I, the, the time I didn't even really think about. Um I guess we need to probably start wrapping it up here. Yeah. I, w- I wanted to ask, I had one final question as we're wrapping up on this note. So is this an actual Texas Parks and Wildlife State Park? No, this is the only fort in the state that's run by the county. Okay. Um, fort Richardson is Texas Parks and Wildlife, mm-hmm. Griffin's um, Texas Historical Commission, Concho City owned, but we're the only one that's run by fort. So we're funded by, uh, we're set up kind of like our own precinct. Um, we have our we're, we're under the auspices of precinct too but we've got like our own budget um, and that's all tech, young county taxpayer money um, except in that, that taxpayer money is just for the maintenance of the fort the, the grounds maintenance and building upkeep and stuff like that everything that we've done in here with the renovation we um, got a hotel motel tax passed and that all all that money has to go back into tourism um, and remodeling a museum is definitely a part of tourism so that's kind of how we're how we're funded there, so and that's where i was kind of segueing into where jeff was going so how can people i mean how can people can they other than coming out is there a way they can support the museum i mean do you guys have like a friends of well uh, yeah there is there there's a, a friends of fort belknap um which is um 
uh, people that support volunteer. Um, and we've also got, if you're interested in it, we've also got a Fort Belknap Living History Association. Um, and if you want to get involved that way, um, absolutely. Um, and and it, all this information can be found on our on the Fort Belknap Facebook page. Okay. Um, there's we, we put when we, whenever we do events or anything inter- that I think is interesting, um, we'll put on there. And then also uh, historical information. You know, um, I, I'm pretty whenever I find something new about Fort Belknap, I'm pretty quick to get it put on. Um, the pay, Fort Belknap page. So. Well, what I find interesting in that, so and I'm not knocking anything, but it's obviously because I always assumed that it was a state park. Sure, sure. So, well, and if you look at like Google Earth or Google Map, it says Fort yeah, Belknap State Park. It does. And it's I don't know how to change that, but it's not. No, it's so. But what I find it, what I like about this is you can tell upon arriving here that it's there different. is no bureaucracy in deciding what artifacts go there it's <laughs> yeah, what yeah. you find is a genuine historical yeah, yeah, article absolutely and so when you come in here and and I, I can't stress this enough to people if you like museums in particular even i mean this is amazing when you come in the, the, the you. they have the artifacts and the descriptions and they're there and and i mean when you look and there's a real texas ranger yeah feel yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely yeah 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 on the wall yeah and, yeah. and you know there's dinosaur bones that's you know yeah. from the local area yeah. there's yeah. you know the the, the mob, little bit of everything the yeah. mobster yeah. uniform suit hanging on the wall yeah. i mean <laughs> you know there's it, it's just absolutely amazing yeah. so, well and it, it all kind of even we've got some stuff that has nothing to do with fort Belknap or even young county yeah but the reason that they're here is because somebody um it was a governor all red all red unit up in, in wichita it was right. named after governor all red well whenever fort belknap was the museum was being turned into a museum governor all red and a state senator uh ben o'neill really got behind getting artifacts here and so governor all red donated a lot of stuff um to us and so uh the mexican um um general's um suit and his sombrero and all that that's all from governor all red that story in itself is absolutely amazing of who that suit belonged well, to. So, I mean, it's, it's just one of those things that everything is here for a reason. Right. And m- my job was to interpret that for everybody to know, you know, to show why that's wow. here. So anyway, it's, yeah, we've got a great, great collection of stuff. It's so like, I, it, it's like we said, if you're even remotely close yeah. to, to Newcastle, Texas, Please come out and check out yeah. Fort Bell now. Please, please, it's, please. It's great. Well, I know a lot of people come out to um, that drive-in movie theater mm-hmm. down in Graham. Yeah, yeah. It, it, literally 12 miles yeah. from there. We, yeah. we are. Definitely, we, if you're going to come out all the way to go to the drive-in movie, stop here. Absolutely. And you're part Definitely. of the Texas Forts Trail. Yes, we are. Yeah. Um, there, we didn't have... There, because we're a historic site, we've always kind of been included with it, but there, would never, there wasn't a working relationship until... I, and of course I'm going to work with them because it's free advertisement for me. Wow. I mean, but you know, um, yeah, I absolutely, I know Fort Richardson, I know the history of Fort Richardson. I know the people that work there, Fort Griffin, same way, Fort Concho. I'm friends with all these people because we all kind of do the same thing. Uh-huh. Um, and, and so I, I know, um, for a while at Fort Richardson, they had, a um, the lead interpreter there whenever she first started, um, she was sending people to me to get the story of Fort Richardson. Wow. So if they, if she knew that they were going to Fort Griffin for Fort Richardson, you've got to stop at Fort Belknap. And, t- and I'm not saying that about me. I'm just saying no, that, yeah. that right. I, I can't tell the story of, of Fort Belknap without putting in its proper, and, and I have to know Fort Richardson and Fort Griffin history to be able to do that. Well, so I can tell you that I think you're absolutely amazing. I mean, oh. <laughs> you go to a lot of these museums. I mean, and, and some, you know, the people will tell you some stuff yeah. and all, but I mean, Right. This is an amazing experience. Yeah. I think Thank it's you. awesome. Because we've done, what, Fort Richardson we, yeah. two or three times we've been out there right. now. Mm-hmm. And I had no clue about Fort Belknap. Yeah. None. Yeah. And yeah. coming here, I got a different perspective sure. of the history on how Fort now Fort Richardson was created. Yeah. And I had no clue. Yeah. None. Yeah. yeah. I, I like to say we used to... People used used to see Fort Belknap as the stepbrother, <laughs> you yeah. know. Or, mm. it, it, we're not anymore. We're we're the big brother. Yeah, actually. exactly. Yeah. Um, so. Well, I know, and I know you guys work with like youth group. I know y'all do yeah, some absolutely. stuff with scouting. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You, you said that you you guys. I guess you can rent your. Some of your yeah, you can. We and, have if you uh, we rent uh, the barracks out for family reunions and, and birthday parties and um, uh, all kinds of different events. Yeah, the the relationship with the Boy Scouts is one of the one of my favorite things that we've got, especially with with um, in Wichita Falls. 
those guys are amazing and I will do everything I can to cater to them because not b- b- because they're so well behaved yeah um, but they're very respectful of the grounds um, and so I'm going to do everything I can to, for those kiddos to have a good time when they come out here so that's like when we took the Boy Stouts out to Fort Richardson they were great in all yeah. locations yeah. Well, and, I, and I'm still involved with our local units mm-hmm. so I, I mean in uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and let here. me say this: we do. We also have an, an, an another tie with uh, Wichita Falls. Our cannon that we have here is the one that starts the hotter than hell race. So we're there every year to start the hotter, and we take that cannon up there to shoot it off. So if you're not listening, the hotter than hell race is a race in the middle of August in Wichita Falls, Texas. If yes. you're not familiar with Wichita Falls, Texas, in the middle of August, it's not called the hotter than hell hundred yeah. for a re- yeah. for any other reason. <laughs> yeah, it is extremely extremely hot. But anyway, it's about. I think they've had 10, 12, 15,000 people. Yes, it's absolutely. a major bicycle race. I remember when they first race. started it yeah. Yeah. years yeah. ago, yeah, and yeah. it was just a couple. It was like locally, mm. and now there's people coming from Germany. It they is. shipped it's their bikes over. It's yeah. international. Yeah. People and it is, all over it is an absolute honor that we get to go up there. and Because sh- I'm at the starting line. Yeah. And I get to shoot a cannon to Heck start yeah. this thing. <laughs> <laughs> but what's funny, though, is um, that morning, you know, there, I mean, there's tens of thousands yes. of bikes everywhere. And I'm trying to drive through the Kager <laughs> parking lot to get to the cannon. And people are screaming at me because I'm in a truck. And it's, listen, lady, you don't get to do this unless Until I get I, to where right. I need to be. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that, so there's another. I, I, we have a, I have a really close relate. Of course, my, my wife being from Wichita Falls, and we go up there all the time. So, um, you know, we... we uh, um, I have a uh, absolute. Um, well, in Wichita, we're kind of the stepchild of Texas too, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. everybody considers us Oklahoma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so Jim, before we uh, shut this down, you said you can be found on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Is there any kind of website somebody can go to? I mean, Google. I'm sure you can go Google. For yeah, it um, we don't have a website. Um, uh, uh, because we are county, right? Okay. We don't have the funds for that. Okay. So, uh, you know, I started that Facebook page yes, so um, that we could have some kind of presence online. Okay. Um, but uh, it's absolutely public. You don't. I don't think you have to have Facebook to be able to look at the Facebook page. Right. You can okay. scroll through all of okay. it. So, all right. any other social media, Twitter, Instagram? No, I, I don't like know that. how to okay. operate any of that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well. I know I, I can speak for, for the rest of our team. We really appreciate yes. your time oh, tonight thank y'all. Thank talking y'all. about the history. We're all, all three of us are history buffs. We like it when we're going to do an investigation. That's, for me, one of the big pieces. The investigating's fun and all of sure, that. Sure. I like the recon. But actually doing the recon, getting the history of yeah. the location. Yeah. Um, and we just... Oh, yeah, you come here and listen to the sheriff's shoot. That's, yeah, where do you hear that? I mean, that's real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there. Before we shut down, one more question. Sorry, um, there was actually no battles or any kind of skirmishes on Fort Belknap that you know of, right? No, no. there there wasn't. There no was um, no, no, no. Um, the I mean, you. It, there's countless accounts of um, people getting attacked just a few miles outside of Fort okay. Belknap. Okay. I mean, it, and I've there's this one um, uh, newspaper article. It was actually out of the Dallas. Um, Herald relayed from Fort Belknap of um, a wagon getting attacked, I mean, two miles north of here and coming in hot into the fort and it had arrows sticking out of it. And it looks like a cartoon. I mean, when you read it, you think it's something you've seen on, uh, on a cartoon before. But, you know, there, there's that. There was an incident incident in the town of Belknap where a guy got drunk. There was a whole bunch of 2nd Cavalry there. This guy popped out to the 2nd Cavalry, bullets flying, um, and um, General... Uh, uh, it ends up becoming General Thomas, George H. Thomas, uh, the Rocket Chickamauga. Um, he was in command of Second Cavalry here. He actually goes over there and kind of breaks that um, that that up. But um, you, yeah, there were there's definitely a Wild West style thing. But there was whenever you think of, of Indian um, soldier battles, right. not, nothing okay. like that. No. Okay. And the, the soldiers that were here were very possibly they were involved in skirmishes. Around. Oh, absolutely. They, you know, one of the things, one of the problems with um, the soldiers here on the front of Fort Belknap is the monotony was killing them. Alcohol was a huge problem, but you did have instances of these excursions. The way the soldiers worked is twice a week they would leave Fort Belknap and go to the next fort in line. And what they're doing is called cutting for sign. They're trying to see if Indians had crossed over that trail, and then they could get warning to the towns and east. If they saw where the Indians had come in. 
and gone back north or back west, they would follow that line. So you've got a ton of expeditions, um, the Wichita expedition, um, uh, where the soldiers leave out of here. And then, I mean, there's a battle in Wichita, um, Oklahoma, um, that that um, has direct ties here, but the battle wasn't specifically here. But yeah, the, the soldiers here definitely, uh, you know, they, they did see action. It wasn't the, like the biggest thing it, it was it was rare but there was and when they did see action it was usually hot really 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 uh, good stuff so and then as we close up from a i guess from what we're here for right we're gonna we're gonna check it out we, you know we don't consider ourselves ghost hunters per se no. we're here we we usually go investigate claims of the paranormal and we're here to see if there are if right. there are yeah. claims you know we've right. done the same thing in the little town i'm from um we went through and we actually found a couple of buildings that were like pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, and it's interesting. I mean, I've had, there, there's been quite a few people that come here that, you know, they, they feel something or they experience something or something like that. And so, I mean, that's kind of, you know, with y'all being here, well, let's figure this stuff out. Exactly. Yeah. Let's you know, see if we can find yeah. something. It may, maybe it'll bring some people in to, Absolutely. to see the, yeah. see the fork. Absolutely. Okay. Well, let's close up this yeah, podcast for tonight. <laughs> it, this isn't our typical podcast. Yeah. Because we normally try and do one once a month, but it's been a while. But this one is. Well, the whole COVID thing has kind of knocked us down. And yeah, everything. yeah. And and we've been, we've been really busy. We've been, uh, yeah, just trying to get back into the swing of yeah. things and kind of running. We we've come and done this. We've got a cases coming up up yeah. in North Oklahoma. We've got some, um, just a bunch of little mini expeditions that's been going on. Mm-hmm. And I will say we didn't open up with it because we're kind of doing this a little yep. dry here. But you can always find us at militaryparanormal.com. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Instagram's the new one. All right. Yeah. Our and YouTube our YouTube channel. channel. Correct. And um, be sure to check it out. And don't forget about your YouTube channel. Oh, yep. Undiscovered, Undiscovered Origins. Undiscovered Origins. And I have all the Rob. social. And then Rob here, since we've met last. Yep started up doing the paranormal road rider and that's how i actually came out here to meet yeah. up with you guys and meet yeah. jim mm-hmm. takes his motorcycle and goes around investigating the weird and and always remember we are not affiliated with any branch of the military exactly. all so, retired jim thanks again yeah. absolutely thank y'all and uh like i said come out here visit fort bell definitely spend some time talk to jim he will give you the whole history of this area yep. um so thanks a lot and we'll talk to y'all later. Yep. We'll see you guys next time. And Allison's on her way out, so yep. I'll say it for her. Bye, y'all. Bye, y'all. Have a good night. Thank you for listening to the MPI Paranormal Podcast. This podcast has been brought to you by Military Paranormal Investigations. Hope you all enjoyed the show. Don't forget to connect with us on Podbean, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Until next time, the truth is to be found. Thank you.